Welcome to the Full Fact Podcast, where we find bad information one fact at a time. I'm Alexis Conran, and on this episode, we'll be looking into the history of false information. We often think of misinformation as a modern problem, but its roots go back to thousands of years. And this episode, we'll explore the history of misinformation from ancient Sumer to the age of social media. Joining the Full Fact podcast to discuss this today is Jacob Sol, a history professor at the University of Southern California, and of course, our editor Tom Phillips, author of A Brief History of Bullshit. Thanks for joining us both. Thanks very much. Thank you. Jacob, what is the oldest piece of misinformation you've come across? Misinformation obviously has existed since the dawn of time. But what interested me when I began thinking about this phenomenon was thinking about news itself. And for news, one needs public opinion and one needs communities. So one of the things that sort of struck me was the arrival of these sort of moments where people were using media to spread things they knew were not true. So, for example, I really think that in the Middle Ages, we can actually see moments where we have willful uses of media to spread, for example, anti-Semitic stories about blood libel, about Jews drinking the blood of children. Obviously, you can go back to ancient Rome, you can go back to the news that was put in the forum about what the Senate was doing, but there's a sort of difference between news and rumor, and we have a very long history of rumor, and I think the hard thing is, is to actually figure out this idea of the willful use of media to spread falsehoods. Tom, in your book, did you notice a, a, a shift perhaps between the sort of the rumour mill to false news being used for political gain or for financial gain? Did you notice a, a shift from one to the other or have we always had both coexisting throughout our history? If we think that modern technology or the modern media age is causing these impulses within us, then we're wrong. But it's absolutely right to say that, yes, the sort of the invention of media in all senses of it, be that the printing press, newsletters were sort of the, the first form of, of media in some ways, handwritten to begin with, and then they turn into print, and that's how newspapers are born. That really takes it into a very different place, where all of a sudden, it's not just rumour being passed person to person, where information travels basically at the speed of someone riding a horse. All of a sudden, you have these networks that start to develop and all of a sudden people can start using it for their purposes rather than just it being the standard way that gossip has functioned presumably since the dawn of time. One of the things that I think we do have to look at is the idea and this is really hard to do historically of the willful use again of these of media to spread misinformation. I think another realm has to do with finance and if you look at the bubble of 1720 and both in France and in England there was a willful use of information to spread news to try and bolster the stock prices of both the French India Company and the South Sea Company in England. Yeah, and like newspapers can also have a financial incentive to distort the truth. You, you can see that in the example of the, the Great Moon Hoax, which Jacob, of course, you'll know about. Very famous example, 1835, the New York Sun, which has only recently been set up as a newspaper, publishes a sensational story about the discovery of life on the moon, where there were sort of blue goat unicorns frolicking through fields of red flowers and these sort of strange ginger-haired bat people who lived on the moon. This wasn't motivated by finance, but the financial rewards were huge. Sales of the New York Sun went through the roof. They were able to print special editions. They were able to print booklets of the, all the stories collected together. They had prints commissioned of the scenes of life on the moon. They made a lot of money, which enabled them to invest in new presses, which enabled them to cement their place as one of the preeminent new brand of popular newspapers in the New York media in the time. And so this was completely false, but it was very clear from this point onwards at this sort of moment of change for the media that actually untruth could be quite profitable. There is that sort of walking on that tightrope of if you are competing in a very tight market where a headline can mean that you sell more papers or people uh, are going to click on your website. That is an awfully big temptation, isn't it? Always the financial gain from having eyeballs on your story. You know, I just wanted to note that, you know, in the 1890s in America, we have the heyday of the American, what was called yellow press, 
run by figures like William Randolph Hearst, who you know were pushing fake stories to create mass hysteria and to you know move American politics, for example, towards war or towards specific goals. In 1896, Arthur Ox founds the New York Times as a paper that does fact checking to give facts so that business people will have a source of real information to make sound business decisions on. So that is a marketing tool. It's kind of funny today because much of the American business community now thinks the New York Times is a kind of a left-wing mouthpiece. And what's so interesting is Fox News came on saying we're fair and balanced, which doesn't mean we actually do fact-checking, but it means we're fair and balanced. So they use that same sort of pitch to create a, a complete propaganda machine. Do you think that that's what false news has as its super weapon? It's quick, easily digestible, and very often it plays on the emotions. I do think it's moments when great numbers of the public are scared, you know, and they feel threatened. For example, they are threatened economically. We see both the United States and Britain where fake news played an enormous role. We have the worst wealth inequality in the industrialized world. And many of the people following that news were people who were victims of this changing economy in which the lower middle class and middle class and poor people have been extremely affected by wealth inequality in Britain and the United States. So we do get these moments. There's one thing I do want to point out, though. When I was young, I grew up in the other Cambridge, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, although I went to Cambridge in England. When I was young, local journalists were known figures. And I remember this because I remember our local journalists in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They were well paid. So they would take people out to dinner. They were sort of pillars of the community and famous drinkers, you know. So they were, you know, there was a pub scene in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the local journalists were fixtures on those scenes. Journalists don't get those, they don't get those salaries anymore. Local journalists don't even exist, let alone have, you know, drinking stipends. So this entire world of the trusted local figure whom you know, to whom you can go speak you can call, you, you know this person, that person's gone. And that sort of connection with the news is gone. I think the news seems sort of very far away. And it seems more and more like Hollywood, like a kind of dreamland. You know, the BBC's main building looks like a sort of magical castle. And to get into it, you, know, you, have, to, you have to have some kind of golden key, right? So I do think we're at a point now of fear and mistrust that did not exist 20 years ago. Tom, I remember, full fact, CEO Will Moy, when I first spoke to him, he told me the story that when full fact was formed and Will picked up the phone to let newspapers know that, you know, there's a fact-checking charity uh, around, he said, uh, some of the newspapers said, oh, fact-checking, yeah, we used to have a department that used to do that, but we no longer do. Is what Jacob's saying there about journalists and being well-respected and well-paid, is that a contributing factor to the fact that we have so many of these false news stories making the national press. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting that journalists, you know, on regular polling of what professions the public trust, normally come out down the bottom, round about, you know, politicians and estate agents. The weird thing is, though, exactly that point is local news figures are trusted way more in the places where they still exist, they are trusted a lot more because there is, in fact, this connection to community, all that sort of thing. The trouble is the trust is there. Unfortunately, the business model has kind of gone out the window. And so, yeah, this is a problem. And so as the news industry's business model shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and our drinking stipends tragically go away, as it happens, it also pushes this thing of like a lack of connection because you don't have the time anymore to go out and pound that beat or, you know, walk the streets and make those contacts because most journalists are having to churn out however many stories a day on increasingly shrinking budgets. And there just isn't the time. There isn't the time to develop those contacts so you know what's really going on, but also there just isn't time to do the basic fact checking. This is a systemic problem. Sometimes it is due to bad actors. I want to be very clear about that. Sometimes it is due to people who do not care for the truth, have no interest in it, they're doing something else. But much more than that, it is a systemic problem that the 
financial traumas of the news industry has really imposed on this. And I think that that's something we have to be aware of, because ultimately there is no solution to this without a solution to how do you pay for news. And, you know, there are interesting things happening across the news industry, but we always say this at full fact, you know, we do fact checking and yes, it takes time. Sometimes it takes a ridiculously long amount of time. Something you'd think would be really simple can take weeks of work to actually establish what the truth is. Truth isn't simple. Falsehood is nice and easy. It takes no time to come up with it. It's nice and believable. It just spreads, whereas the business of actually working out what is true is long and complicated and messy and annoying. As you say, the business of working out what is true is a long one, and the history of it is long too. I wonder if I can ask you both, maybe this is putting you on the spot a bit, for your favourite piece of misinformation in our long history. What's, what's the most interesting example you've come across? Oh, God. I mean, my favorite piece is for, I mean, I teach this one in my class all the time. I mean, and I think this is, I teach it because of global warming, because I get students in the United States who will walk out of my classes, and I teach in an elite university here, and people will walk out of classes when you say, look, this university's policy is that global warming is real. You know, two, two or three students in a large lecture hall will get up and walk out because their parents have told them to do that, essentially. I think that the Lisbon earthquake of, if I, if I remember correctly, I don't have this in front of me, 1754, really stands out as something I try and explain to my students, where the earthquake happens on a Holy Friday when the churches are filled with candles. So once the earthquake happens, Lisbon starts burning, then a tsunami comes up the, the Tagus River into the center of the Baishu of Lisbon and destroys the entire city. The church then turns around and says, look, this is because of sins, but it also sees a real opportunity. And I do think there were those in the church at the time that knew this wasn't true. They said this is because of the Jews and the crypto Jews. So we get back to, to anti-Semitism and to racism again. You know, this is because of the sins and because of these crypto Jews in our midst. And this sort of is one of the things that begins the international career of Voltaire, the most influential international figure of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, who says, look, this is not an act of God, but this is essentially, this is geology. This is the movement of the earth. This is a scientific phenomenon. And also, God doesn't act as a punisher. God is a great architect. God works through clockwork. And this just happened because of nature. And this argument always strikes me because this is the first time we have an argument about a natural phenomenon and how to explain it in the public sphere. Is it God punishing bad people or is it just a scientific phenomenon? And this is the first time that this happens. So I always, I feel like I have to teach this to my students. It's one way of approaching it without first coming on and saying, look, I'm going to hit you over the head with global warming. I'm actually going to explain to you not only how natural phenomena and science were presented in the news or in history, but how it happened as a sort of public argument and how Voltaire won that one partially. Although you had people like Alexander Pope responding, saying that's a sort of unromantic you know, response. We, have to, we still have to believe that God acts rather than is an architect. And this, by the way, was one of the moments when religion changes and you get deism and the emergence of atheism. And so these are huge sort of moments in history. That one seems like an, a turning point and the beginning of the modern fault lines, if you'll excuse me, between sort of non-scientific, non-fact-based reporting and another form of understanding things publicly. Tom, I'm going to have to ask you the same question as well. Surely you've also got a, a marvellous bull story that you can share with us. <laughs> oh, I, I have so many. Um, so I'm, I'm, I am going to, I do have, I do have a favourite and like favourite is probably the wrong word there, but um, it actually goes back to something Jacob was saying earlier about the manipulation of this for financial gain, but also the fact that is it just financial gain or is it actually about a deeper belief? The fantasy becomes your reality. My favourite is the greatest con artist in the history of the world, Gregor McGregor, who is Scottish, would you believe? <laughs> it's almost Boaty McBoatface, uh, Tom. There. I mean, it really uh, are is. Are you sure but, he's but, a real but, character? Well, yeah. Uh, Gregor McGregor. 
that. Now, like, some con artists will ply their con by, like, inventing a fake business or a fake sick relative or something like that. He invented a country. He invented an entire country that he said he was the Kazik of. The places on the coast, northern coast of Honduras called Poye. And he did all of the things Jacob was talking about. This is about a century after the South Sea bubble. But he manipulates media. So he goes around pressing the flesh with the influential journalists, doing all of that. He publishes an entire book that is mostly plagiarised and the bits that aren't plagiarised are made up, selling this country that he claims he has been given the rights to as literally rivers flowing with globules of gold. He commissions somebody to write patriotic songs for it. He has money printed for this country. He invents a chivalric honours system and starts awarding people the Order of the Green Cross. All of this is to raise funds on the stock market, but also to encourage people to actually go and settle it. So hundreds of his fellow Scotsmen embark on ships to go and settle this country where they're told that there is like a large capital city uh, already awaiting them and there's already residents of this country and they get there and it's empty, mosquito-filled, swampy jungle. Sounds like the fire festival. Sounds like he invented the fire it festival. Really, he, yes, absolutely. It is 100% the fire festival, except a couple of centuries earlier. The <laughs> thing about this that I love is not only the ambition and the 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 ins- but also like if he'd put anywhere near as much effort into actually making his plans come true as he did into inventing them. He might actually be like, like, like how that worked is not radically different to the colonial era generally, right? He just, Absolutely. he was so busy Absolutely. inventing it that he didn't bother doing it. But m- the thing I love about it is that once this was exposed, the few survivors, because most of the colonists died, the few survivors sort of <laughs> straggle back to London and tell the story of this. There are two interesting things that happen. One is, he doesn't stop. He spends another decade still trying to get the Poirier scheme off the ground. He moves to France and tries to do it there. The French only realise when they suddenly get a load of passport applications for people going to a country that doesn't exist. He carries this on way, way after there is any hope of this being a successful scam, because by this point everybody knows. So at some level, it seems like he really believed in it. It's a kind of a, you know, if you build it, they will come kind of mindset. The other thing is that there were some survivors who got back to London and stood by him. This thing that Jacob was saying about people really, really want to believe, there were some people who, despite having been promised a city, uh, you know, they were promised roles, like they promised to be head of the the royal theatre of Poirier or the governor of the bank of Poirier and things like that. Some of them get back. Despite having got their discovery, it was all not true that there was just swamps and disease. Some of them get back and are still got his side and go like, no, he never lied to us. And that, I think, is absolutely fascinating, if slightly depressing. No, there's a huge history of the idea, and this I'm actually writing about this right now. I'm writing a history of free market thought, which is also a history of what's called free market thought, the history of a dream. And that dream is that the tropics contain the source of all mm. wealth. And Columbus believed that at the end of of the Orinoco River, there was a giant breast that was just spewing gold because there was a deep belief that the tropics held El Dorado. And by the way, it was people like Drake and Raleigh who really began this myth. And this myth endured Mm. for so long that if you went to the tropics, it would spit gold at you. And so we have these long ancient tropes in our cultures of where wealth will come from and how it will come. My question is, did he believe himself? I mean, that's one of the other things. I've, I've been friends with some con people, and they often seem schizophrenic because they seem to truly believe their own cons. And, you know, this, this goes into politics too, right? I mean, at yeah. a certain point, you have to wonder what people really believe. Exactly. And, you know, like, as you say, like, there's these these myths, you know, the kingdom of Prester John and things like that, that like, this idea of of these places that exist, and that they seem to, we want it to be true. And we recapitulate this into our sort of modern things as well. But yeah, no, I, I, I think it's fascinating. And as you say, you know, Donald Trump, to what extent does he know he's lying? To what extent does he just actually convinced himself of the truth of lots of these things? Gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, Now, we've just got time for me to throw in my favourite historical fake news story. 
And that's the story of Count Victor Lustig. He called himself a count, he wasn't. But he's the man that famously sold the Eiffel Tower twice. Right. He got his idea from reading a newspaper column that said, well, we've got a bit of a problem with the Eiffel Tower. This is back in 1925. Uh, how are we going to maintain it? It's falling into disrepair. And he got the idea to uh, pass the rumour around that the Eiffel Tower was going to be dismantled for scrap. So he found some scrap merchants and he managed to get one of them to buy it off him. But this is, goes back to what you were saying, Tom, the fact that uh, he knew that his mark, his victim, would be so embarrassed that he would never actually go and tell the police about it. And he didn't. So it was it was kept quiet, which was uh, why Victor Lustig was able to hook another mark and sell it again before fleeing to the US to evade arrest. So... Um, there we go. Perhaps we need to do a whole podcast about scams. Right, we've got to bring it to a close. But thank you so much, uh, Jacob. Uh, really wonderful, fascinating stories. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your views and your knowledge with uh, myself and Tom. Tom, as always, thank you. That's all we have time for here on the Full Fact Podcast this week. This episode was released on the 19th of October 2020. And so this episode about the history of misinformation may now be missing some recent history. And just a minor fact check to add, the Lisbon earthquake was 1755, not 1754. Sorry, Jacob. Uh, now, Jacob is an expert in his field, but his views are not necessarily a reflection of full facts. Full fact is independent and impartial. And you can read more about our commitment to impartiality and neutrality at fullfact.org forward slash about. As a fact checking charity, we depend on your support to call out false and harmful information. If you enjoyed this episode, become a supporter today at fullfact.org slash donate.